In the mid-1950s, Werner von Braun and Walt Disney worked together to produce an educational series revolving around space exploration, with episodes like Man in Space and Man on the Moon. One episode from 1955 showed von Braun's concept model of a 200-foot wide space station meant to house 50 men. Von Braun understood that using fictional forces to create gravity was going to position the astronauts on the station as walking on the exterior walls, not on what would be perceived from the outside as the floor. The astronauts' heads, wherever they are in the craft, would always be pointed at the rotational center of the moving structure. So when looking at the crosscut of a module, although you would expect the orientation to be like this in relation to the access tunnel, it would actually be like this with everyone's feet facing the outermost wall of the station. If there are, as promised, regular showers and toilets on board this station, that is where all the water would flow to as well, the outermost points of the station furthest from the treatment facilities located in the hub. In order to combat issues of the inner ear, a space station needs to be as wide a radius as possible, with enough rotations per minute to create the fictional forces required to approximate gravity, but not too many so as to induce motion sickness. Outside of normal gravity, the semicircular canals which dictate your sense of balance will struggle to compensate for the differing forces at play. There is a Goldilocks zone, where the issues of the Coriolis effect and canal disease are minimized, also taking into account tidal and tipping effects all of which we will explain in a bit. But let's see how this station fares in this regard. The space station as depicted on their website is comprised of a series of rings extending outward from the center hub. Moving outwards from the docking hub, there is the LGA, lunar gravity area, where guests would apparently move about in 20% of Earth's gravity, just like on the moon. Then the MGA, or Mars gravity area, where the gravity will supposedly mimic Mars's 30% of Earth's gravity, and the outer ring, which is accessible by four elevator shafts to suites supposedly offering full artificial gravity, mimicking Earth itself. Using this graphic, we can approximate distance from the rotational center to edges of a component to express this as a ratio of the total radius. And as it turns out, all the measurements have a common factor of 19. The hub takes up the space from the center of the station to 6 19ths of the radius. The LGA takes up space from 6 19ths to 11 19ths. The MGA sits at 12 19ths. And the outer ring sits at 16 19ths to the outer perimeter, which would have a circumference of about 1.5 kilometers. The webpage artificialgravity.com has a handy little calculator where anyone can punch in the radius of an object, along with the rotations per minute, and this will determine the g-force that it will simulate. Since we know the published diameter of the station is 488 meters, the radius is half that at 244 meters, and we have applied that to the ratio of the radius for each feature boundary. First thing to do was find out how many rotations per minute it would take for the station to achieve 1 g at the perimeter of the outer rim, and as it turns out, this was 1.9144 rotations per minute which of course has to be the rate of rotation for the entire station. So if the outer edge of the station is experiencing one full G, the inner boundary of that same ring structure will only be encountering 0.84 G. The hub area, including the docking structure, will be experiencing the least amount of artificial gravitational forces, ranging from complete weightlessness to 0.31 G. The lunar gravity area will not actually be experiencing 0.2 G, it will experience g-forces ranging from 0.31 to 0.57. The Mars gravitational area won't be experiencing 0.3 g as promised. It will instead experience g-forces ranging from 0.57 to 0.63 g. And while the outside edge of the station suites could be experiencing one full g, the inner boundary of that same structure will only be encountering 0.84 g. Since it is unlikely various rings of the station will be spinning at different RPMs, the station as designed will not do what it claims to do. Also, the narrator seems to think that moving between these environments for recreational activities such as playing basketball or rock climbing will be a simple matter of taking an elevator, being oblivious to the fact that the body, and especially the inner ear, will need time to adjust to each gravitational condition. Moving between them at will is simply not going to end well. Complaints of the inner ear, moving from one situation to another, can result in vertigo, dizziness, feelings of nausea, even vomiting, 
and in extreme conditions, a loss of consciousness. The closer a visitor gets to the center of the station, the more difficulty they will encounter as they move back towards the outer ring of suites. Also, and this is more important the closer one gets to the center, where the floors are moving much slower than at the rim, walking with or walking against the rotation of the station will have a more drastic effect in the gravitational force they encounter. In the LGA, someone going for a walk at 1.5 meters per second would encounter 0.31 g walking side to side across the floor, 0.38 g when walking with the rotation of the station, and 0.22 g when walking against the rotation of the station. Apparently, all these small details have been completely missed by the entire design team, who seem to think people will be walking off arriving shuttles as if they're debarking a private jet at LAX, and walking on the floor in a center hub in normal gravity when there would be almost no gravity in the hub, and what gravity there is would be forcing them to walk on the outside walls. The other station is much easier to do the math on, since there's basically one ring of HABs rotating around a docking hub held together by tension cables. Published diameter of this structure is 190 meters, radius 95 meters. Blinko says the station will rotate at one revolution per minute, but that would only give the outside edge 0.10 g of rotational gravity. To get to 1 g on the outer walls, the station would have to rotate at three rotations per minute, which is well outside the comfort zone and would result in permanent motion sickness. On the sweet spot graph, a 190 meter wide station rotating at 3 RPM would be in this region of the graph, and as persons moved from the outer edge to the center docking hub, they would experience tipping effects, likened to climbing a ladder that is being flipped end over end, tidal forces, where the human body is experiencing significantly different g-forces from one end of the body to the other, and vertical coriolis, which is a disorientational distress that can lead to nausea. For reference, a space station that would experience 1G at the outside edge, rotating at one rotation per minute, will have to be 895 meters in radius, or 1,790 meters across, which is roughly nine times the width of this station. So on this chart, green is optimal, yellow is where the spaceport lives, and red is where the Von Braun station sits. Over the course of August and September 2019, most major news outlets were rebroadcasting releases from the Gateway Foundation, advertising how their 2025 opening date will be bringing a cruise ship experience to their guests wanting to spend their vacation in space. We're guessing none of the reporters regurgitating this tripe have ever been on a cruise ship, so we're going to give everyone a crash course on what that would mean. First and foremost, cruise ships take travelers between ports of call. A Mediterranean cruise, for example, would dock in several different cities in several different countries. Obviously, that's not happening on Voyager Station. For days at sea aboard a ship, there would be a full slate of activities for the guests to enjoy. Pool activities, nightclubs, different dining experiences, theatrical productions, spas, gyms, depending of course on the cruise line. To facilitate those activities, they require staff, above and beyond the command structure of officers that manage and operate the vessel and they will need crew to perform all those chores that go unnoticed behind the scenes. Laundry, food prep, cleaning, maintenance, it all requires manpower. For example, this is a crew photo of the 1,450 crew that work on the Carnival Horizon, and the Carnival brand is a discount cruise operator. With an expected max holding of 1,250 guests, 835 crew members will be required on the spaceport to maintain a cruise ship level of service. Those crew members will require an entire slate of amenities to be provided, room and board, transport expenses, health care, recreational activities, for which the company cannot charge money, and those employees would expect competitive salaries for their services above and beyond those amenities. Also, cruise ships typically swap out their crews every six months, with some contracts going eight or nine. This will not be possible for employees working in space, because even a month in space can cause serious bone loss and muscle atrophy along with radiation damage. Remember, at best, there will only be a single deck experiencing a simulated 1G environment, with the rest of the ship experiencing a fraction of the gravity required for proper body functions. Astronauts train for years to become familiar with the rigors of space. Persons wanting to perform service jobs in space are not likely to be highly trained astronauts, 
and those persons training to be astronauts are not likely going to want to wash dishes or change your sheets. Which brings us to the recruiting page for crew members. There are a lot of cruise ship recruiting scams all over the world, taking advantage of people's desire to join the industry. The premise is that it costs X number of dollars to register with the company, and then they will promote you and your skills to the various cruise lines. But that's not how the cruise line recruiting system really works. A legit cruise ship agency doesn't charge a fee of the worker and makes their money fulfilling cruise line requirements with qualified candidates who are then paid for locating the people they need by the cruise line. Yet, on the Gateway Foundation website, if you want to apply to be considered as a crew member, regardless of your qualifications apparently, all you need to do is send $49.95 to the Foundation and they will assign you a crew seniority number, so long as you continue to pay that amount every year for your annual membership. For $499.95, you can get the lifetime membership including your crew seniority number and a free notebook with a pen. Should have picked it up last year when it was on sale at $399.95. Just FYI, if any cruise ship hiring agent pulled this trick, they would instantly be identified as a fraud, so it would be interesting to know how many people have fallen for this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. On the same webpage, there is also mention of the Gateway Lottery, offering a chance to win a free trip to the space station which completely ignores the fact that advertising or conducting such a lottery is illegal in most countries, including the US and in Canada, which both have strict regulations about having to buy tickets to win prizes. Once we spotted the pay to play for crew and the lottery scheme, we started looking into who and what the Gateway Foundation actually is, because the more we dug, the less information we were able to find. We started by looking into the use of the word foundation, because as a U.S. organization, this company must follow laws and tax codes. In the U.S., a foundation is defined as a type of charitable organization, and an aerospace tech startup charging millions of dollars per ticket to visit an orbiting space station for a luxury vacation would be hard-pressed convincing anyone that they are a charitable organization. Since there is no independent entry for the Gateway Foundation pretty much anywhere online, including Wikipedia, we took information from John Blinko's LinkedIn profile and compared it to the Better Business Bureau profile for the Gateway Foundation to determine an approximate start date. It would appear to be September 2012, after he quit his job of three years flying Boeing 747-400 cargo aircraft on the Yangtze River Express. The BBB listing states the Gateway Foundation has been in business for eight years as of August 2020, and the listing says the company has no reviews at all, but it still has an A-plus rating. And we're willing to bet that's going to change once people find out what they're up to, or not up to, especially if those people have paid hundreds of dollars for lifetime memberships. See, if you Google the address provided by the Better Business Bureau, which matches the address on their website, you would probably expect that it would be a large industrial complex or an airplane hangar given John's piloting experience, somewhere big enough that they could be developing all the tech they say they require to construct gigantic rotating space stations in orbit. What you wouldn't expect it to be is what it actually is. A P.O. box in a strip mall UPS store in Rancho Cucamonga, California. Nope, not even kidding. The company telling the world it will provide a rotating space hotel in orbit by the year 2025, looking for investors with millions to spare, seems to be nothing more than a P.O. box visited by a washed up cargo pilot with a reported net worth of less than a quarter million dollars. Those $500 lifetime membership checks wind up in one of those little rented cubby holes that cost $20 a month. Information on Blinko is sporadic. He has no Wikipedia entry, same as his Gateway Foundation, same as Gateway Spaceport, which has to raise further alarm bells since he's been in the spotlight with this project for more than five years. And apparently, this grand venture doesn't merit any mention on his own Facebook profile. When we started researching this episode, that is certainly not what we expected to find. We also didn't expect their senior design architect to be a condo designer with a strip mall office in Rockland, California, or that their business development officer is a cookie-cutter real estate lawyer from New York who is co-founder and or CFO and or director 
for half a dozen similar tech startups from LA to New York to Florida, including CEO slash CFO of his very own United Space Structures, another web page loaded with glossy CGI animations, but these ones are depicting imaginary mining operations on the moon, which very likely has no more of a toehold in reality than Gateway does. Given this information, it's likely that some of our viewers will start doing a little digging of their own. When you do, let us know what you find, and if we get enough new material sent in, we'll create a follow-up episode. I'm sure there's a bunch of material out there. Long story short, there have been no, and there are no plans for, experiments in orbit with regards to mimicking gravity using a rotating habitat. The closest NASA ever came to having one attached to the ISS was a $100 million proposal called Nautilus X, but it never made it off the drawing board. Since there is no experiment being planned, there will be no findings, which means there will be no numbers to base a rotating station off of, of any size, or at any rate of rotation. So to have a foundation that's probably not a foundation, selling annual memberships to be considered as crew when recruiting agents aren't allowed to charge fees, promoting a lottery to their members in contravention of state and federal laws, for a chance to win a free visit on an orbital platform that doesn't exist, that would cost hundreds of trillions of dollars to launch, to be built by a company with no usable proprietary tech, whose mailing address is a P.O. box rented from UPS in a California strip mall, seems to be ridiculous by any measure imaginable. On a final note, we would really like to thank journalists from across the world for helping make this episode possible by not doing their due diligence and actually questioning all of the obvious and grandiose claims made by both Mars One and the Gateway Foundation. Thank you for watching this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. Hopefully our viewers have all been aware enough to steer clear of all these schemes and will be able to identify the next one a little easier by thinking like a skeptic. As always, informed comments, questions, and episode suggestions are welcome in the comments and hit that subscribe button to be notified when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.